Welcome back to ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. We are joined today by my co-host, Tim Apicella, and our esteemed guest, Jean Rosenfeld. We're going to talk about the, a very interesting article that appeared in the Washington Post entitled, a News Site Editor's Ties Shown to Iran and Russia. Global disinformation, in my view, can begin right here at home, and it's global. Welcome to the show, you guys. So, Gene, why don't you start and summarize, if you will, the article that appeared in the Washington Post, because it is chilling. Uh, it is a breaking story. It is a revelation in many ways in the context of all our discussions here on Think Tech about propaganda, social media, disinformation, misinformation. Uh, and here now we find that uh, apparently legitimate news sources, legitimate media, larger media, are involved and include people who are spreading those lies. Can you talk about the article? Yes, apparently uh, <clears throat> there's disinformation that has been run actually from official Iranian sources through a, a show, uh, an Iranian uh, media show to an American online site. Uh, with the intermediary and editor at that American online site being paid by the Iranian government to shovel this information into uh, American social media. And it has had wide dissemination. So those that are receiving it are unable to tell the difference between somebody who's kind yeah. of a amateur troll or is linked to a particular source that might be biased one way or another and is receiving from uh, Iranian information through an American source. And uh, it's being this particular person uh, has been uh, published or online in major news sources with his opinions to a very great extent as well. So it's, it's almost impossible uh, at first glance to be able to distinguish between reliable source and unreliable source. Well, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time and, um, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, an, it's a phenomenon that's sort of creeping in our conversations and creeping in in our world. Um, and it's certainly present in Trump's efforts to change the subject and, um, you know, avoid uh, criticism um, and avoid political effect of his, uh, his felony convictions. But it's also happening around the world. There are a lot of a lot of elections this year, including Modi, which just happened in India. Uh, so, Tim, let me let me just ask you for reaction here. Um, it's worse than we thought, isn't it? It is, and you know, again, I, I'd like to make the distinction of, um, and Gene has perfectly stated it, is that they're getting better at it, and it's more uh, covert versus overt uh, propaganda. And it's very, very tough to distinguish that which is misinformation versus what are real facts. And, you know, the overt, uh, in the days of overt propagandists, you would have Tokyo Rose and Father Coughlin before uh, the breakout of World War II in the United States. And uh, today's equivalent would be Steve Bannon. Those are the overt um, misinformation suppliers, if you will. And uh, but now we have the infiltration of where people get their news, their media. Uh, remember, a lot of younger younger folks get their media from TikTok, and um, there's that's the wild west of information. As is still um, uh, Facebook, which is mega, and yeah, or excuse me, Meta. That was a Freudian slip, uh, or X with Twitter. You know. Um, so it's we're all we're all stuck in our information bubbles and there's no cross checking uh, like in the days that we used to have uh, three major news channels and you could always switch from ABC, NBC or CBS. But now we uh, we kind of hunker down and we're, we're subject to our own information bubbles. So any information misinformation that is set, it's usually not cross check and that that's disturbing. And I think that what makes the difference of why Donald Trump hasn't been deposed. He's been quite successful on maintaining misinformation. 
and, and, and people not uh, verifying its inaccuracies. And I don't think the, the major media companies have done a sufficient job to point that out in the last eight years. Yeah, we saw Kellyanne Conway talk about an alternative uh, set of facts back in 2016. And we were not all that threatened. We thought it was really silly. And that we, we just we wondered how it could be possible that somebody on a national campaign could make those statements. But now this this phenomenon has um, processed its way into every aspect of our lives in this country and elsewhere around the world. And it has certainly changed the way mm, the species operates and the way government operates. So uh, let's let's talk about um, you know this particular uh, organization, the one that was infiltrated by these guys who had connections in Iran and Russia. Uh, wh wh where do they fit in the firmament of, of media, and just exactly how bad was the disinformation, and how questionable were their sources, Jean? Well, um, there were two um, individuals quoted. Uh, Wayne Reed and a fellow named Blumenthal associated with disseminating the Iranian information. Blumenthal happens also to be the son of Sidney Blumenthal, who was <laughs> associated with the Biden administration. And it's not that he's disseminating Biden information, it's anti-Biden information, I'm sure, although he has written both on the left and the right. However, uh, it's whatever Iran wants, he's getting paid for. And uh, the fact that he has a legit, he has a name that is a known name connected with an honest person who is well known to uh, our press, you know, think New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and so forth, uh, gives him cred, gives him a lot of credibility. So, um, you know, Paul Manafort was, uh, shown to have been uh, a foreign agent for Russia, never registered, and he was uh, indicted on that fact and sent to prison, and then he was pardoned by Donald Trump. But we're seeing that Trump's rise, as Tim was pointing out, is really due to the manipulation of information more than anything else. He's a master at doing it. You will note that right after his trial and conviction, the first thing that came out from the Trump campaign wasn't a denial, it was a statement that, oh, they had raised a lot more money as a result of that. That captured the nurse cycle right away to, to turn Trump's infamy and loss into some kind of a win because he's got more money to run for president now because he's victimizing the government, you see. So it's trying to create a world that the individuals paying for it want to create in the minds of others. This is hybrid war because instead of using guns, you're twisting people's minds. You're gaslighting them, you're feeding them information, and it's becoming more professional, more slick, and harder to uh, defend against. Although uh, the Euro European Union right now, because there are 27 elections going on in Europe, is uh, has created a crisis unit, a disinformation crisis unit. I think we're going to be seeing more of those. I wouldn't be surprised if we have one in the United States right now, but uh, not to our knowledge. And I think this will become common knowledge because it's just like putting on a military defense because the objectives are military objectives, and that is control over the minds of a population. If you can change their minds and you can manipulate the interior politics of a country. You don't have to overwhelm them with bombs and guns and so forth. It's interesting, you know, there was an article, um, I guess it was in the Times yesterday about uh, the United States Navy and um, how it had uh, invested billions and billions and hundreds of billions, trillions into uh, aircraft carriers and the like, um, and uh, had made itself a very strong, very well-armed uh, Navy. Um, but the the point of the article was, wait a minute, is that really relevant anymore? Is it relevant to have a big aircraft carrier when you can change the government? You can do non-kinetic things. You can do hybrid war against that country and and change it without firing a shot. 
Um, and I think uh, Mr. Putin has been a, a, a pioneer in this. Others have been pioneers in this. Um, and the technology, uh, just as in the case of the Chinese Navy, and the Chinese way of um, you know taking territory and changing minds, uh, is happening all around the world. And what this suggests to me um, is that the old-fashioned notion of voting by citizens who read the newspaper, who inform themselves, who have good information to make good decisions, that, that time is probably over. Um, and there are those who would uh, change the way people think and change the way you know elections are conducted, if conducted at all. Uh, and we are in a new time, and it's happening so quickly that we don't realize um, that it's affecting us and many other countries in the world right now. Look at Modi, Narendra Modi in, in India. He was the odds-on favorite, and the election was very close. And I'll suggest to you, and I think the press will probably pick this up after a while, is that that was because there was social media running against him. And therefore, at the end of the day, it was a close election, although nobody expected it to be. This is happening everywhere, and you don't know who the bad actors are. In this case, in the Washington Post, we know, we found out, and good for them. Uh, good for any journalist who finds out and discloses what, what was going on, but it doesn't happen that often. Tim, your thoughts? Uh, you are spot on when you say we're, in a, we're, we're dealing with a non-kinetic means of warfare. I think we're in the, the middle of a, of, of a non-kinetic war. And what we used to refer as to as the Cold War is heating up rapidly. And your actors are, as Gene has mentioned in previous shows and programs here, is you, you have China, you have North Korea, you have Iran, and you certainly have Russia as the four main actors of this non-kinetic uh quickly temperature rising uh, hot war and it all goes to the formation of governments or the destruction of governments and uh, you can have all the aircraft carriers you want as you just suggested and that is minuscule issue to if you dismantle a government without firing a shot and i think that's something that our media needs to now look at where donald trump is with this guilty plea or plea excuse me this guilty conviction and, and, and call it for what it is, one huge distraction away from the fact that he's a convicted felon. And in, in doing so, they're, they're tearing down the justice system. Uh, they're, um, this morning, I think it was Steve Bannon says, for every district attorney out there, they need to be under fire. Uh, or if they're a Republican district attorney, go after Democrats. I mean, these are blatant words that were spoken. And um, Miller also is doing the same thing. Uh, former uh, staff member, what's his first name, Miller. Um, Stephen. Stephen Miller is also telling legislators, you know, prepare for your, your alternative ballot for the electoral college. It's happening now. So Gene, what, you know, where does this all lead? Um, you know, let's assume that the Washington Post article is just a voice in the wilderness. Let's assume that people do not find out, do not know, do not care that their information is being manipulated by, um, you know, people who do not have their best interests at heart. Um, let's assume that, um, you know, the ones who have access to social media, uh, the ones who are better at lying, better, slicker, more professional at trying to change public opinion in their way, not in the way that suits public interest. Uh, let's assume they prevail. Where does it all take us? Not only in this country, which we care about very deeply, but about the world. Well, we have now developed technologies that exceed our capacity to control them. We are flooded with information and what formal agencies have to deal with day in and day out is too much information at a pace that they can't sustain a response to. So if, when you get flooded and you're, there'll be periods of time when you, the disinformation artillery is going to overwhelm you. And that is prior to elections primarily and because these are aimed at democratic states. Uh, prior to elect, because these, the countries that, that don't, that are not democracies control the information that comes into their citizens that, they control the population. They have completely shut down 
information except what they want to convey. There are Sami's dot type information that leak through to the elites in Russia, but not, not appreciably, not enough to make a difference. So they're seeking control over the minds of democracies, much as they control the minds in their own countries. And think about the implications of that. What that leads to is a cheap and bloodless victory of authoritarianism at a time when even in democracies, authoritarians are being turned to because these are people who are very positive and very action oriented and people are insecure. This disinformation campaign and the kinds of campaigns that somebody like Trump wages is aimed at any sense of security in the civil servants and the traditional institutions of your own country. Once you want a revolution or an apocalypse to overturn and change the constitution, um, you've gotten there because you've changed a mind. Aldous Huxley comes to mind, um, Brave New World. Um, and uh, what was it called? Soma, the drug of Soma, where you did not participate uh, as a citizen anymore, you were just told what to do. Uh, and we've had various expressions in the arts about this, and they're prescient. Um, I think this is this is likely to happen. It's happening. And I, I suggest that it's, it's happening quickly. But to go to my question, so who emerges, Tim? Who emerges as the autocrat? It would seem to me that the autocrat needs to have this kind of propaganda you know, weaponry, it needs to understand the the, the non kinetic war. Uh, he needs to be. He needs to rise above uh, all the other social media disinformation, misinformation, and and this is an important part of my question. He needs to use AI in developing and uh, distributing his messaging. Uh, so who emerges as the autocrat, the leader, with these weapons? The person that follows Donald Trump as the next presidential contender um, of the MAGA movement. I don't think it's any one individual any longer. I, I think Donald Trump's uh, heyday as the primary cheerleader is, is waning quickly. Uh, he's had loss after loss after loss, and this conviction certainly is a loss. Um, his lo you know, he's been tarnished as a winner. So, but his movement is moving forward and it's moving forward with great acceleration. And I guarantee you someone will emerge out of the MAGA movement as the, the next candidate that um, becomes more of an autocratic nature. So I, I don't know if it's who that individual is at this point. Uh, I don't think it's Donald Trump, but it's the, uh, the person who follows after Donald Trump. Yeah, to me, it sounds like a battle among the people who can reach the public and change the public opinion in their favor. Right now, it seems to be Donald Trump, but he could lose it. Somebody else could emerge. Arguably, somebody will emerge at some point. And so you don't have a logical succession to power. Um, you just have the, you know, the people who can um, you know, hold power, create power um, out of this technology. But, you know, the, the question, and, and really this uh, Washington Post article uh, asks the question is, who, who can stop this? Mm -hmm. Can the Washington Post by itself stop this? Um, if the media got on board with the Washington Post and, and, and investigated, examined all these examples and brought it to light in front of the, you know, the public, um, would that stop it? Because there are some people, you know, as Tim said, who like it, who want it this way. They want to be told what to do. Um, so you can have a, a thousand Washington Posts all revealing the very mm, unhappy set of circumstances. Um, but would that change things? And if you were Joe Biden, what would you do to counteract this information? Uh, if that's directed at me, Jay, um, I would say that if you look at our politics today, uh, the people who are uh, at the top, uh, who have the, the, the reputations in both parties, 
It's a gerontocracy. And there are young leaders coming up who are very um, anxious for the boomers and the silence to please move aside. They want to move up and out. Just the, the look at the race for or the consideration for vice president for the GOP. Um, these are not older people. These are younger people who have their careers in front of them. They may or may not believe what Donald Trump believes, but they're going along because they want to have major careers. Um, so we don't really know what they think. The problem is that we're not in a situation anymore where people are looking at the policies of the contenders. We're not talking about policies. We're talking about character. We're talking about institutions. We're talking about information and disinformation. We're talking about uh, a revolution. We're talking about carnage. We're talking about apocalypse. Uh, we're talking about opinion. We've entered a new universe. Maybe it's a pre-matrix universe, we don't know. But um, this is a generation that is reading graphic novels and even famous novels um, <clears throat> are being turned into graphic novels in order to capture the minds and hearts of this generation. No matter you know, how intellectual a child is, they're gonna be turning to graphic novels and, and video games and the visual. So that packs a punch, that packs an emotive punch. So much of what people are thinking about and deciding about today has to do with emotion. A lot less has to do with critical thinking. And even if you're a good critical thinker, it's very easy to be misled by a very slick AI uh, type operation that originates in uh, the enemy of your country and is being laundered through an internal fifth column of people who are traitors, but don't see themselves as traitors. Yeah, you know, it, it strikes me that when you take some of these um, uh, Congress people, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, Bobert and um, the guy from Florida, he's my favorite, um, and you put them out there, well, you know, what are they really selling? They're selling misinformation. They're selling lies. Um, and it, it, it almost is, you know, you can make a connection, say, well, what, what makes them popular? What makes them successful? They are. They're successful. They're in the public eye. Well, it's the lies. And if you lie better than the next guy, you're more powerful than the next guy. And that's the same thing with Trump. If you lie better it's like The Apprentice. If you lie better and you come up with more stories that appeal to these emotional receptors, um, you know, then you're more successful. And I and I worry about the culture changing. I've said before, I worry about the midnight entertainment uh, on cable. You know, more and more the movies on cable are about vengeance and violence and dark themes. And civil Isn't war. <laughs> No, 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 yeah. no, no. <laughs> it should never ever go down. Yeah. And so, you know, it's almost like the more you can lie, better off you are. Um, and the better off you are, the more power you can have. And it's like the end of rationality. So when the um, astute and objective observer takes a look at this, he says, this is, this is the decline of a society. Your thoughts, Tim? Uh, well, the last show that we did, uh, the write-up I, I put out there was, is the criteria for character, the character of our leaders, is that criteria now lost or is it just somewhat forgotten and needs to be revived? And I, I think that's a critical question in this election that's coming here in November. And that is, to what degree does, does content of character count for anything any longer for our, our elected leaders. And until we answer that, we'll be going around and around the mulberry bush here with AI and, and propaganda. And until that, that central question is asked and answered, um, we will be in chaos well after the election as well. Gene, you mentioned uh, getting flooded 
um, with uh, information, whether it's disinformation or legitimate information. Um, you know, I started off with um, one one uh, email address, and and I get all this crap on that one email address. So I developed other email addresses to try to avoid what I was getting at my primary email address, and then I gave up. Um, and you know the 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 spam filters don't really work and you wind up getting i wind up getting hundreds and hundreds of email addresses emails every day and i'm taking one sh small example which i think you know you may you may find interesting john tester out of montana okay i like him the good democrat i'd vote for him if i lived in montana but i get an email from that man or his um, you know campaign team um every 10 minutes all day, all night, every day, every night. And he's flooding my inbox. And he is uh, forcing forcing me to delete him over and over and over again. And he's not the only one. Don't I do mean, that, Jay. He's in a tight race and he'll flip the Senate if he loses. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I like him. I'd vote for him. But, but the problem is that he is, he's letting me have it. And so it's not only the bad guys that are flooding my my, and some of them are, by the way. I'm I'm getting some really bad email from Trumpers. Um, it's all of them, and it makes it very hard for me to find the email of value. And it's really the same thing on messaging because they all have my my phone and they're doing the same thing on messaging. Um, so, Gene, can you talk about you know the slick aspect of all of this? and the flooding aspect of all of this, and what flooding does to the average person who's trying to make rational reaction to it. Well, I think in the younger generations, at least from what my kids and what, what I see from my grandkids, um, they're not using some of these uh, outlets anymore. They're not using email. They're not getting uh, their news from the major sites. They're going to podcasts. They're going to Facebook. And they're getting pretty good information, I would say. Um, so there are alternatives to what our generation uses and the boomers use and the mill millennials use. There are alternatives. It's such a, an overwhelming uh, array of uh, operations, steps, um, sites, um, devices that we're all called upon to use today. We all know that you don't do face-to-face -face or telephone anymore. You have to go to your computer. Even if you're facing somebody face-to-face -face and running a car, they want you to go on your iPhone and message them by iPhone opposite the glass window and complete the, the whole thing. And this, of course, is contributing to a tremendous solitariness that's uh, invading our culture, that people are living more solitary lives. They're um, interacting via screens. There's an epic of loneliness. Suicides are up in the older generation as well as younger generation. It, it's something that um, happened long ago in the early part of the 20th century. There was a huge rural to urban migration. People came into cities and they lost ties with their primary communities. And this is why we have sports stadiums. Uh, national sports grew up to bring people back together. And in fact, it did the job. I mean, particularly men relate through sports. We know that and follow national teams. That we're, we're experiencing this as a byproduct of the technological revolution that we're in now. So there's a lot of discomfort, loneliness, um, an over sense of overwhelming um, time taken up trying to learn these new operations and utilize them. And then to be learning on top of that, that you need somehow to distinguish between what's true and what's false, what you can trust and not trust, uh, who is telling you the truth and who is dissembling or is a con person, it's overwhelming. It is. And um, Tim, I want to cover one other thing that uh, I find very interesting that uh, arises out of that article. This is this phenomenon is international. 
<clears throat> there's no reason why the Internet Research Agency in Moscow can't reach everyone in the world. And they are. Um, everyone in Europe easily. And lots of people, lots of people in the U.S., in Latin America, in Africa, wherever he wants to have influence, he, he uses this. And at the end of the day, if we follow the discussion we've been having, he gains, he, Putin, gains power in every place that he can exercise that influence. So what you have is not only a, a kind of Trump experience here in the U.S., where you can change the government at an election. And P.S., listening to this discussion, I wonder how many elections we're going to have after this one, if at all, if any. Um, because you don't need elections if you can determine public opinion by um, using disinformation. But I, I wonder, going forward, how this changes the world. How does it change the world in India, in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, aside from the U.S.? It's already changed the world in, in Russia. They'll believe anything because he's got them lined up uh, behind state TV and state newspapers <laughs> and so forth. Um, so it changes our society, but it changes it on a on a on a, a boundaryless world. It doesn't have to be limited to a country. You can be in one country, just like Putin. You can be in one country and invade the other country. Well, you can be in one country and do a a, a non kinetic invasion of other countries anywhere. And this technology is really good. Um, so we have people who can influence everything, everywhere. How does that change the world? Well, I think it gives all would-be autocrats um, an open door, uh, a new opportunity to um, misguide, excuse me, mislead, uh, provide false information, and be successful in obtaining power in office. Uh, that's what the opportunities lie. And uh, the more autocrats you get, the more, I, in my opinion, the more opportunities for warfare, kinetic warfare, uh, you know, misery, you know, the haves and the have nots. Um, autocracy is not the best form of government, I don't think. And uh, that's my answer. Well, I'm worried a lot about that and um, worried about what, what um, we know the technology exists. We know it's being used. It's being used more successfully. It's accelerating. It's visible. Um, and its effect is visible. But Gene, suppose I am Joe Biden. Suppose I'm not an autocrat. Suppose I'm an ordinary mm, Democrat. I mean, in a small d. Uh, and I and I want to and I want to do the right thing by people. I want to I want to correct this. I want to countervail on what's happening. Um, with this phenomenon that we read about in the Washington Post. Uh, how do I do that? Is it possible to do that? Can Joe Biden do that? Can other Democratic leaders, can that woman Scheinbaum in Mexico do that? Uh, can rational, moral leaders do it too? Across the boundaries, to the world, straightening things out, providing real information. Can they do that? Well, first and foremost, I think we need to have a more realistic perception of what leaders can and cannot do when they are democratically elected like Joe Biden or uh, Scheinbaum in, uh, in Mexico. I don't think she can root out the cartels. I don't think she can get rid of corruption in Mexico. I don't think Joe Biden can solve the immigration problem. I don't think Donald Trump can solve the immigration problem unless he wants to institute concentration camps. That's why autocrats are so um, are, are so appealing today, is they promise to reverse the things that uh, the information system makes us care about. I mean, we really don't have an immigration problem. We could absorb 35 million more immigrants and it would help our economy, but that's not the message that's getting through. It's now become a political, emotional, social media football. Nevertheless, presidents are curtailed because they're only one branch of government and they are fail safe by the Supreme Court and the legislature, at least in our constitution. Now, if the thing about the media is that it makes every man a king. I mean, a person like Steve Bannon, who's really a very fragile, marginal personality, in my opinion. Uh, he can 
make himself a media king just uh, by getting the backing of a charismatic leader like Donald Trump and um, forming a social media who can form a social media company and 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 support him, let's say. And also uh, we'll line up the plutocrats. We now have American oligarchs like Peter Thiel uh, behind people like Donald Trump. Th these are not Democrats, these are autocrats. He's taking a page out of Putin's book. And so he's consolidating power uh, through money and through influence and through information sites. And he's making these uh, marginal individuals uh, into little kings. Clearly, uh, the devolution of power through the internet is frightening to anybody who wants to consolidate power in one person. That one person therefore has to take control of the information business. And that's what the GOP and Trump are trying to do. They're trying to manipulate the information business in league with our enemy Russia. I mean, that's that's just an unfortunate circumstance. I don't believe in conspiracies, but I've seen enough evidence so far that I can draw that provisional conclusion. And until I'm I'm convinced otherwise by legitimate information, I'll I'll stick to that. And my like my uh, provisional con conclusion, Tim, likewise, is that this whole process we've been talking about the, the business of disinformation um, favors autocrats. It does not favor moral democratic would be leaders. Um, a, do you agree? And B, I like to ask two part questions. And B, you know, it seems to me that the big tech companies who deal in social media, who deal in in the propagation of, um, of information, uh, including AI companies, especially including AI companies, have it within their power to clean this up. They could make, for example, a program that says, Tim, I will give you only legitimate information. Gene, I will only give you legitimate information. All you gotta do is subscribe with me and it'll be you. You will avoid all the noise and all the flood. So those are my two part questions. That's my two part question for you, Tim. Well, since I have a limited memory, I'm going to have to hit the second part first. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of pr previous discussions with Jeff Portnoy and the importance of the First Amendment and how regulation should be uh, prohibited from free speech. You have the rights to turn everything off, and and I'm thinking, well to some degree maybe has a point and that is maybe it's up to the individual consumer of information to discount everything to believe that everything is potentially misinformation no matter where you get it from and then back up and say now if i want to find the truth or the truth is i think it will be reported i now seek out that source that is credible as a news source or as a social media source and uh Everything should become suspect until I can prove otherwise that maybe I'm looking at the truth. And I think on the first part of your question, I agree. <laughs> you know, um, one, one thing that, that strikes me, Gene, is that um, you, you spoke about emotion and how, you know, at the end, the, the species, and you've studied this in so many ways, the, the species has is, is got a bit of a flaw about emotion, okay? And so if I reach, say, my base, and my base could be anywhere, it could be, you know, hundreds of millions, but could also be billions. And I reach my base on, a, on an emotional level, and I say to them, you've got to go out in the street. You've got to take over. You've got to, you know, demolish uh, democratic institutions. That's powerful simply because of the numbers of it. Uh, meanwhile, the ideal person that Tim is talking about, who uh, excludes anything, he, anything, he excludes anything, and he thinks for himself. He makes rational analysis. He only seeks rational information. He makes rational conclusions. He takes rational action. He takes longer, doesn't he? And he may not come to that, his rational conclusion in time while the other guys are out there in the street driven by emotional calls for action. Gene, isn't that a tremendous advantage for disinformation? 
Yes. And I don't see any way to get around emotion, frankly. I mean, there is a subset, a very small subset of human beings who are less impacted by emotion and are much more impacted by reason. But they're so minuscule that it's not going to make the difference that we want it to make. So in a sense, we have to police our own emotions. We have to, I, I wouldn't go as far as Tim. I wouldn't discount everything I hear. But I would insist that we look at our educational system. And in addition to incorporating the tools, the devices, the material things of the internet revolution, such as um, iPads in the classroom and so forth, um, that we retool the way we teach children and look at what's coming through their receptors, through their devices to their brains and what we need to utilize in the human brain, which is a very pliable, plastic, fluid, incredibly um, uh, resourced uh, organ. And we figure out how we can best filter, how we can best filter that information. It isn't, as I said, just a matter of critical thinking. I look at this source and I look at that source. And then I, I, I try to, I ask questions and I try to answer those questions. Yeah, you can do that kind of filtering. But even before that, you have to start thinking, where did this come from? Who is the individual that is promoting it? Is there a name attached to this? How do I go back to where it came from? How can I trust it? These are new questions, you know? I mean, maybe professional researchers uh, like myself, <laughs> to some extent, will ask these questions, but the ordinary person wouldn't. But we can teach every kid to do it. We really can. And, and looking forward, perhaps, to teaching next year uh, a small group of college students, I'm going to be very oriented to how they think and how they find out things, not just what they think and where they find them. We're almost out of time, Tim, but I want to go back to a comment you made about sports, <clears throat> sports stadiums and the like. And uh, that's not new. That was, I think that was Gene. <laughs> oh, well, okay. It doesn't matter. Um, so you have sports, and sports are a change in subject. Sports, uh, you know, take you away from whatever the reality is. Um, sports, um, you know, um, are a, 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 a diversion is what they are. And the Romans used that. It's one of the ways the Romans held on to their empire, you know, using those stadia and using those gladiators, what have you, not unlike uh, the apprentice, actually. And uh, it wasn't necessarily rational, but it 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 um, it attracted attention and it um, took all the oxygen out, at least for a time. And we have sports today, lots of sports. And look at that paper. You know, half the paper is about sports. And in the case of local papers, it's more than half the paper. I mean, Honolulu Star Advertiser, for example. Um, but um, my question to you is, uh, is that the future? That's actually in some of those books about the future. That you use it like stoma. You, use, you, you make an alternative universe, you know, Conway's, uh, Eliane Conway's idea. And you you laden it with sports, and it keeps people busy, and it, it, it distracts them from what they should be thinking about. Where does it fit in the future of um, humans' interaction, human society? Well, first off, sports is valuable because it helps channel our aggression, our our tendency for violence, and it channel channels it into a civilized display of aggression and violence. Uh, so for that purpose. You, uh, it's a pressure relief valve on a hot water tank, if you will. It, it's useful uh, so that we don't have wanton violence in the streets. Um, but does it anesthetize uh, the American public and Europe and everyone who, who values a lot of sporting activities? Sure, it's a distraction. It's escapism at its best. And uh, why would you want escapism in a society? Because uh, if you are the powers to control the society, 
it's, it's easy to manip manipulate a population. And the best way to manipulate is to distract. To, um, that's why Roman, the Romans did it. The emperors had uh, you know, the circus, the, bread, the free bread and, and the circus uh, mentality to distract them, to get their minds off of the problems of Rome. And that's why it was so successful so often. Okay, time for final comments. Gene, you must have some, um, you know, sort of uh, assimilation of uh, this discussion. What do, you, what do you want to leave with our audience? Well, I, I want to leave with a sense of challenge. First of all, we may not recognize when we're in a major conflict with another entity as large as ourselves and our allies simply because it's being conducted with a weapon we don't recognize. And I think we've brought that up in the discussion today, that information has been weaponized. Uh, there are disinformation campaigns going from us to them, as well as from them to us. And in the past where it, maybe it's been Tokyo Rose or the Voice of America, um, it's now on steroids. It's now consuming us. It's going so fast we can't keep up with it. Governments are beginning to uh, organize uh, counter disinformation campaigns and crisis units. Um, and we're gonna see an increase in this. In the meantime, we have to learn how to resist this tendency to isolate each one of us. Technology is very self-isolating. We need to find other modes of community that we can depend upon so that we have a sense of community and united purpose, because that will counteract the uh, disinformation campaign to distrust our own society. America is not in decline, but that's the picture that Steve Bannon and Donald Trump have brought to us through his inauguration address. It's not American carnage. We're, we're better off now than we've ever been. That message isn't getting through. So we need to, in a sense, find modes of resistance, and they're there, they're starting up, uh, to uh, a problem that we very little recognize and needs, as Tim has said, to be brought to our, um, to our consciousness by major outlets right off the bat. And the Washington Post has done at least one article on that. It needs to follow on a lot more. Wow. Notable comments. Tim, your thoughts? My, my thoughts are going from between now and the election, that there's a concerted effort from the media companies to do exactly as Gene suggested, is that um, dis disinformation has to be addressed and overtly addressed. Uh, I'm starting to see shades of that after a speech from Donald Trump or President Biden or any politician. I'm starting to see... Um, a fact checker come on the air and actually go through a list of, of things stated in a speech and whether or not those things were accurate or not accurate. And uh, that's a start. And we need a lot more of that. And we need actually, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the daily dialogue of society, who's out there putting out misinformation and what's their personal agenda for doing it? Yeah, that's the lesson of this article, isn't it? Naming names. Uh telling you who's corrupted and who's providing bad information, putting you on notice. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tim Apicella, Gene Rosenfeld. This has really been a wonderful discussion. Aloha. Mm -hmm.